So again, welcome to our fourth and final panel of the day. Uh, I'm Matthew Stevenson. You've met me before. I'm going to be, I have the good fortune to be able to moder moderate this final panel. And I only sort of mean good fortune. I, I got to set the schedule, so I got to pick that I wanted to moderate it. I particularly wanted to uh, have the opportunity to engage with these uh, fantastic panelists we have with us. Uh, let me just introduce them briefly. Uh, to my immediate right is Jose Ogaz, who is the uh, chairman of Transparency International, probably the leading international civil society organization that focuses on issues of corruption. Uh, he is also a very experienced attorney and prosecutor and served as the ad hoc attorney in Peru in numerous corruption cases, the most prominent of those involving former President Alberto Fujimori and his deputy, Vladimir Montesinos. Uh, and then over in the end there, uh, Paul Holden is the Director of Investigations for Corruption Watch UK, also an expert on South African politics, uh, a subject about which he has written uh, numerous books. So um, with that, let, let me get things started. The, the theme uh, really for this panel very much picks up on something that all the other panels have, have talked about, but I thought was a particularly a focus in our discussion of uh, toxin in Thailand earlier this morning, and that has to do with the role of institutional checks and balances, especially legal uh, and judicial institutional checks and balances, and questions about the extent to which populist leaders of various kinds are able to subvert or undermine those institutions, and conversely, the extent to which those institutions can provide meaningful safeguards against politicians who are interested in engaging in some form of corrupt self-enrichment <coughs> or consolidating their own power or both. Um, this panel is a bit more challenging because we're trying to, to cover two very complicated countries, not just one, uh, but we'll see if we can pull it off. Uh, and I think maybe the way to start the panel off before we get into these issues of legal institutional checks and balances is to give both Jose and Paul an opportunity to set the stage for the discussion by saying a little bit uh, about the backgrounds and histories, respectively, of the cases of Fujimori in Peru and Zuma in South Africa, uh, and in particular, the ways in which they may resemble some of the other cases we've talked about today, Estrada in the Philippines, Toxin in Thailand, Berlusconi in Italy, and of course, Trump in the United States, but also some of the ways in which they might be importantly different. So, Jose, maybe I can ask you to start off with talking about Fujimori. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. Uh, it's amazing the similarities you can find, despite of the colorful, specific local differences. There are a lot of similarities in all these uh, stories I have been hearing uh, this morning and, and afternoon. In the case of Fujimori, uh, he's a Japanese descendant. Uh, he was a totally... Uh, uh, considered nobody with a public profile in Peru. He was, even though he was a rector of the agrarian university, he was not well known. And suddenly he appeared uh, in the public scenario trying to, to be president of Peru. And he competed with Mario Vargas Llosa, that probably is the most well-known Peruvian around the world. Now, uh, Nobel Prize for Literature. And he defeated Vargas Llosa. I will not explain why, because we can take some weeks here trying to understand this phenomenon. But the thing is that Fujimori won. And uh, he won, and he was not expecting to win. He really won because our system at that time, if you run for president and you didn't get it, then you automatically would get into Congress. So he was targeting to be a congressman, and he finished being a, a president of a country without a party, without organized uh, social basis. So that's why he immediately relied on the militars, and at the same time, he got in contact uh, with uh, this personality, uh, former captain of the army, Vladimiro Montesinos, who became later on the mastermind of the criminal network that captured the Peruvian state. Uh, so one of the characteristics of uh, Fujimori, I would say, I, I'm, I was trying to make a list after hearing some of the stories about Berlusconi or Taksin or, or Estrada. Well, Fujimori was not a movie star. He was not a millionaire. Uh, so what brought him uh, to power? And basically, I would say it had to do with he being a Japanese descendant. In Peru, we, people don't make difference if you are Chinese, Thai, Vietnamese, or Filipino. Everybody's called Chino. 
And Chino is for Asian people. And Asian people have a tradition in my country of being hard labor, honest, and high tech. So Fujimori exploited this characteristic, and his uh, slogan for the campaign was honesty, technology, and work. And people really believed that this was going to happen, because we had had, of course, a history of authoritarian regimes, military coups, many of them, and also corruption. Corruption, there's, there's a very interesting book about the history of Peru that is called uh, uh, The Story of Corruption in Peru. And uh, the conclusion of this book is that we have always have had high circles of corruption, high level corruption, never low levels of corruption. So corruption in Peru historically, I would say, like in most of Latin America, has to do with the way we were colonized and uh, the, the structure that was developed by the Spanish in this uh, patronage system of in, in exchange of, of favors and services, and to the point that the viceroys that were sent to our countries were not there because of their merits of public officials, but because they bought the possibility of taking care of a specific country. And then, of course, they arrived and tried to collect the money they have invested as soon as possible. So uh, I think that this offer of Fujimori of bringing honesty in a tradition of corruption, technology in a country that was at that point in very serious uh, threats of uh, terrorism. We had two terrorist groups hitting the country, Shining Path uh, and the Tupac Amaru movement. And at the same time, uh, hyperinflation. Uh, during the first government of President Garcia, we had around 60,000% of inflation per year. So that it was a really crazy situation. So people was kind of desperate. For the political problems of terrorism, Peruvians were saying, why don't we have a Pinochet here that can bring order and law to the country? I mean, people was of course, used to authoritarian regimes trying to bring strong hand to control terrorism. Peruvians were scared. Many people were killed, bomb attacks, uh, uh, throwing down uh, all the uh, uh, towers of, of uh, energy. So we had uh, problems with light and energy very frequently. And at the same time, the economy that was in a very confusing and, and weak situation. So all these promises, I think, had to do with the offer of Fujimori of bringing honesty, technology, and work. Uh, what appeared immediately after he was elected is that, first of all, Fujimori was a liar. He lied even in the origin of himself. There is doubts to, up to today if he was born in Peru or in Japan. And this is relevant because if he had been born in Japan, he couldn't be constitutionally a president of Peru. When a journalist made an investigation, he found a lot of irregularities in the registry. So probably, and his birthday is uh, the day of the national uh, um, holiday in Peru. And now we know, historians have documented this, that when Japanese came and they couldn't express in Spanish, they always registered at their birthday the day of the national holiday. So, and Fujimori has the 28th of July as the day of his birthday. So there are serious suspicions that he lied in his origin. He also lied uh, when he obtained some land from the state. The state had this plan to give land to poor peasants. So he made some fake documents and presented himself as a poor peasant when he was director of the Agrarian University and he obtained free land from the government. He also lied, of course, with his slogan because he was not honest. He had very little capacities for technology and uh, he didn't work that much. Uh, he also lied during his campaign when he had to uh, have a confrontation with Vargas Llosa. He didn't appear and then he said it was because he was intoxicated, uh, eating some rotten fish. That was not true. He just didn't want to, to debate with Vargas Llosa. And finally, his, one of his biggest lies is that during the campaign, Vargas Llosa was offering uh, an economical shock. And he had prepared all his plan around this shock 
how to balance the shock to compensate social cost of this. And Fujimori attacked all the time Vargas Llosa saying, this is the type of elite, traditional elite solution. They don't care about the poor. Shock is going to kill you. I'm not going to make the shock. And two weeks after he got into power, he made the shock. So uh, there were constant lies all the time. And I think that's one of the, the first uh, characteristics of, of uh, uh, Fujimori. The other one is the one that we have heard several times here. He really connected with the people. People started to get enthusiastic with him. They believed he was a very simple man. Uh, his campaign was quite modest. He didn't spent millions like the people around Vargas Llosa. They really threw millions of millions of dollars into the campaign. But people connected with him, with his simple language. And also, the third element that also has been very common in these debates today is that he was all the time blaming the traditional political class, saying, we are where we are because of these people. Terrorism is going to take over Peru if we don't do something because this political class has failed, and we are suffering this inflation because Garcia is a crook. He had no idea how to manage the economy. I'm your chino. I'm your honest uh, technologist and hardworking guy. So I think a mixture of this made it possible. Uh, and he won the election. Um, certainly we'll have a lot more to say about that in a moment. But, but Paul, let me throw it over to you and ask if you can tell a little bit of the story of, of Jacob Zuma. I think the one of these leaders we're talking about today who's actually still the, the leader of his country. Sure. Um, so first, I'm going to start with the differences. And I think maybe the best way to summarize the differences is that he's, of all the people we looked at, I think he's probably the least populist. But he's probably the most plutocratic, if that makes sense. Um, so, uh, to begin with, he he's not a businessman. He's not a he's not an actor. He's a professional politician. He's been in politics since the seventies. Essentially, he fled into exile during apartheid. Uh, he worked at the ANC in Swaziland, uh, and then in exile in uh, I think it was Angola for a long time, and in Lusaka. Uh, and when he came back to South Africa, he had a very senior position within the ANC. After the first democratic elections, he was in government in Kwazulu Natal, sort of a provincial position uh, in the first government. And then thereafter, he became deputy president of the ANC in 1997, deputy president of South Africa in 1999. Uh, and then he became president in 2009. So he's always been in and around politics. And, you know, he's, he's never had a, a large amount of money personally. He's never run a business. And actually, that's been the root of quite a lot of his corruption problems is that he's when he came back from exile, he pursued self-enrichment very quickly in sort of very crass ways that led to a whole series of political problems. Um, he's also not that charismatic, or he's turned out to be increasingly uncharismatic as his presidency went on. So between about 2006 and 2009, it was probably the time when he was most popular in South Africa. That's when he was fighting corruption charges against himself, and he was trying to become president of the ANC, which he succeeded uh, in becoming. Um, but in that period, he was sort of, he came up and he would, he'd have these big political rallies and he would do a bit of dancing and he'd sort of make sort of very self-deprecating jokes. But he himself wasn't necessarily, necessarily a political draw card. Um, said he was chosen by a series of factions within the ruling party and the ruling alliance in South Africa uh, to represent the interests. The idea being that he wasn't that interested in governing. He would be a useful idiot, in a sense. He would be the person that would represent the unions, who had been excluded under the previous president, Thabo Mbeki, that, that he would be a leftist man of the people who would get into power and then pretty much be hands-off, and the unions and whoever else supported him could, could write economic policy and write legislation. Um, he's only been able to stay in power uh, because there aren't presidential elections in South Africa. So he's not personally popular anymore. In fact, his, his personal popularity ratings are in the toilet, really. I mean, they're 20, 30 percent at this point in time. There's probably no more unpopular politician in South Africa than Jacob Zuma. And he's almost going to, there's a potential that he's almost single handedly going to lose the next national elections for the ANC. Um, but because of the particular constitutional and democratic architecture of South Africa, uh, where there's a very dominant political party, the ANC, which since 1994 has won more than 60% of the vote, dominates the political process. Uh, if he became president of that party, uh, 
it doesn't really matter whether he's popular or not amongst the ordinary South Africans because the party is always going to be popular. Or certainly there were dynamics in the country which meant that the party would always be elected with a, with a degree of majority which secured his position. Um, so those are, those are the differences. I mean, the similarities are as soon as he achieves power, he starts doing a lot of the things we've heard about already. So he starts attacking a lot of the democratic fabric of the state. He tries to take over the institutions, particularly around the enforcement of, of anti-corruption. Uh, uh, anti-corruption bodies are, are either dismantled or they're cronies that he puts in place and they don't, particularly, they don't function particularly well. He doesn't focus that much on governance and he focuses a huge amount on self-enrichment. Uh, to begin with, that was... You know, the best example of that in the early phase of his presidency was when information came out that he has a, a homestead, um, a traditional homestead where he keeps all his wives. He's a, uh, he has multiple wives because that's a traditional Zulu male thing to do. Uh, and it turned out that there were a whole series of upgrades that were done to his property, uh, which were described as security upgrades. And they cost about $25, $26 million, which in South Africa is a very substantial amount of money. And it suddenly emerges, well, I mean, everywhere it's a lot of money. But uh, in South Africa, that's you know, really shocking to the average person that your president could potentially steal this amount of money. And it turns out the security upgrades aren't really security upgrades. So the best example is the so-called fire pool. The idea being that there's this pool that's been built that will be used to put out a fire if there's a fire on the homestead. Too bad it's actually a swimming pool. Uh, there's a natural amphitheater. There's a, they build an amphitheater. They say it's to shore up the foundation that it's actually for him to hold plays and whatever. Um, but really, that's small fry, it seems, because over the last year in particular, the last year and a half, there's been a huge amount of new evidence emerging about his relationship with a family called the Guptas. Um, and what it, what's emerged is that the Gupta family have been involved in a, a pretty terrifying process of state capture, um, where through Jacob Zuma uh, and by joining in, you know, becoming business partners with Jacob Zuma's sons and, and relatives. Um, they've used Jacob Zuma's position to ensure a steady flow of state contracts to their, their own, their own state-owned entities. And it's pr proved a real problem in very real macroeconomic terms. It's threatened the, the longevity and the viability of our state-owned enterprises. Our state-owned enterprises, SAA, our, our airline, is massively in debt. Uh, it needs to be bailed out every year. A couple billion rand gets spent on that. It's nearly a billion dollars. Uh, and it seems that now the scale of the corruption is so much more substantial than we realized. Um, one thing that should be pointed out, one of the main differences I, I could see between Jacob Zuma and some of the other people we've been speaking about is that he had already been prosecuted to an extent, or there were criminal charges that were brought against him prior to him becoming president. And he was, he was prosecuted in, in absentia, in a sense. So in 2003-2004, if I believe the date's right, his previous financial advisor, a guy called Shabir Sheikh, was prosecuted. And the substance of the, the case was, you have a corrupt relationship with Jacob Zuma. Uh, I'm simplifying here. And also that you solicited a bribe for Jacob Zuma from a series of, of arms dealers. Um, and Shabir Sheikh was found guilty by the High Court. He was found guilty by the Supreme Court and found guilty by the Constitutional Court. And the trial was a huge national incident. And what was really interesting about the trial was it was information rich. We found out so much about how Jacob Zuma ran his life, the way in which he, he, he procured his finances, and the way in which he used and abused his position. Um, and that meant that when he came into, into office, there was already a clear sense that he was going to have a, a legal struggle for the entirety of his, of his presidential campaign because these charges were always going to hang over him. And that's where I see the potential similarity with Donald Trump, uh, depending on where the Mueller investigation goes. Is that you, it, it becomes a very interesting democratic question, political question. What happens to a, a democratic system where you have a president um, who's accused of a series of crimes, especially when you're legislative and, and constitutional architecture vests a whole series of powers in their president, including the power to appoint in South Africa what's effectively the Attorney General, the National Director of Public Prosecutions. That's the same thing here. Um, and I think that would be quite an interesting discussion to have a little bit further down the line. Yeah, I think we definitely want to talk about those issues. Let me actually pick up on a couple of things you just, just said. So 
Um, the differences that you pointed out between someone like Donald Trump and someone like Jacob Zuma strike me as, as, as right and important to recognize. There does seem to be an interesting, maybe slightly different sort of a, a parallel in what you pointed out, and that if you think about the relationship between the ANC and Jacob Zuma and compare it to the relationship between the American Republican Party and Donald Trump, again, there are many differences, but this idea that he was viewed by many of the traditional elites as someone they didn't really like, but maybe he was a useful idiot that they could control and then turned out not to be able to control. And then also their sense that they don't really like him, but party loyalty ends up you know, buoying this person who seems very corrupt, even when he faces criminal charges, actually seems kind of resonant to me. Because we've been talking a lot about the popularity of Donald Trump and the appeal of Donald Trump. I think that's all right, but my understanding is when we actually got to the general elections, there were a whole lot of people, at least the data seems to suggest, who voted more out of party loyalty than in any sense that Trump deeply connected with, with them. But the other part of what you want to say that I want to pick up on, it really does follow some of our earlier conversations, is the relationship between these figures, in, in, Zoom in, in, in this case, and the traditional institutions of checks and balances, both, both political and legal. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit more, and then Jose, I want to ask you a similar question about Fujimori in Peru, uh, to go in a little more, more detail about the relationship between Zuma and the people around him with the regular judicial system, the constitutional court, the Office of the Public Protector, which I gather is essentially like an independent anti-corruption commission or ombudsman's office, uh, the police and so forth. What was his relationship like with those institutions? What, if anything, did he do to try to undermine or co-opt them? And how effective was he in doing that? I, I mean, I think it's a it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty mixed bag. Um, he was very effective in taking over and co-opting those institutions that seek to investigate and prosecute corruption. So that's in particular the, the National uh, Prosecution Agency. Uh, and there was a body that used to exist called the Scorpions, um, which is an incredibly effective anti-corruption unit, uh, had investigated a whole series of corruption trials, including his. Uh, and after he was, and, and was, I should also mention, uh, actively investigating a number of his allies in the ANC at the time, uh, and as soon as, as he became president, one of the first things he did was to shut that, that organization down. Uh, and he then replaced that organization with a new organization called the Hawks. Uh, he moved it to a different ministry, put it with under the Ministry of Police. The reason that was done was because there's a, there's a direct line authority between the president and the Ministry of Police and, and the Hawks. And effectively, the Hawks are useless. I mean, they haven't brought a, a proper corruption trial at all. Um, and he's done that for a couple of reasons, I think partially, mainly out of self-preservation, um, that he's done that in order to ensure that the very serious criminal charges that, that he faces are never act actively brought to bear. I mean, what happened was, so the story of how, how he got out of them is, is a very telling one about how these systems can be subverted. You know, uh, between 2005 and 2009, it was pretty well known what he'd done and what he'd done wrong. It was very hard for him to argue um, that he hadn't done these things because they'd been proven. All that he could argue was that his prosecution was politically motivated. And he created enough of a, a sort of a populist uprising within the ANC at that moment to bring a sufficient pressure, political pressure, to bear on the then acting pros uh, chief prosecutor to drop those charges. Uh, that chief prosecutor was then made an acting high court judge a couple of days later. Uh, and from that moment, Jacob Zuma has sought to appoint a whole series of really quite deplorable, to borrow a phrase, but quite uh, questionable people into that into that position. Um, so in terms of checking his behavior, the legal system has been very bad from that perspective. It hasn't prosecuted him. It hasn't been able to deal with his corruption. And, you know, because of the way in which he's undermined those those units, it hasn't really been able to convict anybody else, or it hasn't really aggressively pursued anybody else. So that's that's the bad side of things. I should also mention, by the way, which we never really talk about in South Africa, because South Africans are so focused on South Africa. I mean, one of the things I find really potentially scary about Jacob Zuma's uh, sort of approach to the law is his threat to withdraw from the ICC, the International Criminal Court, which came after Bashir visited from Sudan visited South Africa and essentially fled the country where the courts had told him, you have to arrest him, he has to be prosecuted. And Jacob Zuma's response was, we're going to pull out of the ICC. Um, on the good side, and I think the good side is a, a bit more complicated. So there's been very effective legal cases that have been brought against 
uh, a wide range of the worst of Jacob Zuma's appointments, and they've been successful. Uh, so the, the first one was he brought a case against, there was a case that was brought against the appointment of a man called Menzi Simulani as the first national director of public prosecutions. And the courts essentially found that that person, that Menzi Simulani, wasn't a fit and proper person to be in that position because he'd lied under oath during a previous commission of inquiry and you know, all sorts of wrongdoing. That was a very important ruling because it set the bar for, for what would be a legal appointment. And it did constrain the number of people that Jacob Zuma could appoint and keep in, uh, in those sort of positions of, of, of influence. What it has meant is that the people that do then serve in those positions aren't necessarily the best at being bad, if that makes sense. They are pretty ineffective. They're pretty, they're pretty craven. They're pretty useless at their job. And what that's meant is that he's not been able to weaponize prosecution, which is maybe a, a bit of a weird thing to be thankful for. But for a while in South Africa, that was a real problem. That was a real concern. One of the ways in which he understood statecraft when he first took power was that everybody in the ruling elite at that point was corrupt. And the way you maintain your power is you control who gets prosecuted. Um, and th- thankfully, you know, that was very prominent in the first part of his, his presidency. Thankfully, that's fallen away by the wayside. And I'll give you uh, an example of, of, of how poorly this can be done, is that we have a, a, a former finance minister by the name of Pravin Gordon, who was heading the Treasury, and Pravin Gordon and the Treasury were the last bulwark against state capture. They were preventing the sign-off on a whole series of, of very substantial financial deals, which would have netted the Gupta family and, by extension, Zuma's family, a huge amount of money. Probably the most notable one, and this is another parallel to, to Trump, is with uh, the Russian state um, to provide nuclear power to the country, valued at about a trillion rand, about $100 billion dollars. Uh, which basically everybody recognizes makes absolutely no sense whatsoever and, and suspects is massively corrupt. But in trying to prosecute that, in try, so what they tried to do was they couldn't force out their finance minister because he was really popular. So they cooked up a fake criminal trial. But in concocting that, that fake criminal trial, they were so poor at what they did, it was so easy for him to argue that it was a construction, a conspiracy. And nobody in the country believed that there was any substance to the charge. And in fact, as a result, a week later, after these, these charges were announced, they were dropped. But then you know, the, the, the National Director of Public Prosecutions, a guy who basically has been appointed as the last, I think it's been five of them in the last 10 years. He's so ineffective um, that he, any sort of political pressure on him, and he just folded. Um, it's also, I mean, the public protector has played a very important role, and so has the Constitutional Court. And I'll speak very briefly about those, and I'm going on a bit long. Um, so the public protector is what we call a Chapter 9 institution. That's Chapter 9 of the African Constitution, and it has the power to, it sort of sits, the South African state is a bit complicated, but it's essentially it's a four-pillar structure. The Chapter 9 institutions are the fourth pillar, and they're sort of independent of everything, and they're potentially very powerful. They have the power to subpoena information. They have the power to cancel contracts for different institutions. And there's one body called the Public Protector. And since 1994, we've always had pretty terrible Public Protectors. And then remarkably, almost out of the blue, almost by accident, we had a great Public Protector who was appointed in 2011 by Tuli. Her name's Advocate Tuli Martinsella. I'm sure most people might know that name. Um, and she's been voted to South Africa's one of the most popular figures in South Africa, and she's been voted a corruption hero in South Africa a number of times. And in that position as public protector, she's been very effective in investigating those two big scandals, and Kandla and, and, and the, the state capture scandal. Now, it hasn't necessarily led to any criminal charges, but what it has done is that it's put all this information out there in the public domain uh, about the nature of, of the way he's behaved and, and the nature of state capture and just exactly what he's done wrong. The Constitutional Court as well has made a whole series of rulings against him related to that stuff, um, which I think has sort of set a a discursive framework for how democracy functions in South Africa. At this point in time, nobody can say as a result of the public protector investigations and those Constitutional Court rulings that Jacob Zuma is a moral, upstanding citizen who has the interests of the country at heart. Nobody believes that anymore. That's not the discourse. The discourse is we know he is a disaster. We know he's in it for himself. How do we get him out? Jose, let me ask you the same question about uh, Prudent and Forjimori. I'm going to want to ask in a moment about your role as the ad hoc attorney uh, in, in basically prosecuting after the fact. But I'm interested in asking you first, during 
uh, his regime, particularly when he was popular before these media revelations that we're going to talk about in a moment came out, what was his relationship with what you might call the institutions of justice, prosecutors, courts, and so forth? Um, do we, did we see similar efforts in Peru to undermine or subvert those checks? Yeah, if you are leading an authoritarian regime, of course, you do not feel comfortable with an independent judiciary or uh, other check and balances uh, within the structure of the state. And I would say that after the first year of uh, confusion from the uh, Fujimori itself, he developed a plan. And uh, then we knew that it was called the Green Plan, and he... Uh, decided that he wanted to stay in power at least 25 years and change the constitution and other things. But after this first year, he started a campaign, a public campaign against it, the judiciary. Uh, he picked up some two or three cases of corruption within the judiciary that certainly had considerable levels of corruption. And he started a campaign against the judges, calling them hyenas and the need of changing and restructuring the judiciary because it was totally corrupt and he couldn't rule a country with these judges that all the time were putting problems into the political agenda. And at the same time, he started a campaign against the traditional political class and saying that the uh, Congress was all the time obstructing his willing to uh, change the structures of this system that was uh, collapsing. So after five to eight months that he started this campaign, people was prepared, and what Fujimori did was promote a self-coup d'etat. So he uh, talked to the military, and uh, one day we had the tanks on the streets, the judiciary was closed, he threw away all the judges of the country, and <clears throat> appointed by finger all the judges from the lowest levels up to the Supreme Court, and at the same time he closed Congress. So then he was ruling uh, as a dictator, uh, until he was uh, object of pressure from the OAS, the American Organization of States, that uh, uh, obliged him to call for elections again. Uh, it is not surprising that after he did this, he was voted as the first option and he was reelected uh, when he called for new elections after the coup d'etat. Uh, and this time he had some majority in Congress and he offered that he was going to solve uh, the problem of the judiciary. At that time, we have 95% of uh, provisional judges in all, the, in all the levels, as I said before, and also at the Attorney General's office. So he had absolute control of both bodies in, on the investigative side, and at the same time, he had control of Congress, and that's how he then started to uh, promote uh, significant changes in the Constitution. He changed the rule that the president couldn't be for more than five years and not be reelected immediately. He changed that. Then he ran for a second uh, reelection and he obtained it. And then there was a third one that was the one that finally uh, finished in these investigations. But uh, what I would like you to, to have clear is that he sacked the entire judiciary because he felt really threatened and uncomfortable with independent judges. And at the same time, he closed Congress. So let me ask you as a follow-up to talk a little bit about his ultimate downfall. So my, under, my impression is that although there, again, there are very many differences, the story that we heard from Sheila Cornell uh, just in our last panel about Estrada bears some passing similarities in that you had someone who seemed to be very popular longer for Fujimori than for uh, Estrada, but then when the bottom fell out, it fell out very quickly in response to some media revelations that were very difficult to walk away from. At least that's my impression. I could, I, but it could be a misimpression. Can you talk a little bit about what ultimately uh, led to Fujimori's downfall um, from the presidency? How did that play out, especially when he'd done such a good job of co-opting all these other institutions and it seemed to be so popular for so long? Well, uh, first of all, have into account that he was ruling the country for 10 years and uh, there was a level of discontent because some information was leaking from uh, some in very few independent investigative journalists that were posting all the time issues related to Montesinos. Some human rights abuses had happened and uh, organizations of civil society were claiming about these issues. and. Uh, people was really angry when they felt that Fujimori was pushing the Constitution too much. When he tried to force a third re-election, and we had the sense that they were 
managing the state for their own benefit, things started to get difficult for him until the first video appeared. And uh, this is a video where Montesinos, the right hand of Fujimori in charge of the intelligence service and the one in control of the entire network, uh, he was a psycho, so he liked to tape everything. So when we, uh, in the middle of the investigations, got into his home, we found 80 pieces of Samsonite luggage full of videos, 1,200 videos with all the bribing tape, the faces of the people and the dialogues there. So it was quite an easy trial, the one we had to, <laughs> <laughs> to conduct against him. Uh, but when this first video appeared, it was too much. I mean, people saw Montesinos paying uh, $30,000 to this congressman that was elected uh, with the opposition party. And uh, with that payment, he assured that he was going to vote with uh, the, the officialist uh, party. So immediately, people went into the streets. Some uh, opposition leader, in this case Toledo, uh, was leading these movements around the country. So we had millions of people on the street demanding uh, a solution for this. Uh, uh, Montesinos flew away to Panama and Fujimori was obliged to appear on national TV saying that he was going to call for early elections. And then he started desperately to, to make inquiries visible with uh, online TV in different places looking for Montesinos. He didn't know that Montesinos had flew away. And uh, then we understood that he was desperate because he was looking for those videos where he was appearing, and he wanted to take uh, control of those. Uh, so with all these people on the streets, Fujimori had no choice. Uh, finally, uh, the state collapsed. Uh, when he appointed me to conduct uh, the, the investigations against Montesinos, uh, something happened four days after that, is that the brother of Pablo Escobar, the most notorious uh, drug lord of the world at that time, his brother Roberto appeared in an interview in television saying that he witnessed when uh, Montesinos and Fujimori called Pablo Escobar to say him thanks for the million dollars he had provided for the campaign. And uh, there was me, four days in charge, and uh, we had to take a decision. What are we going to do with this information? Fujimori was sitting as president of Peru. Montesino was out of the country. So uh, I talked to my deputies, and we decided to uh, go to a press conference and announce that we were opening an investigation against the president. Uh, three days after, he left the country, uh, pretexting that he was going to a meeting in the Pacific Rim. And then he resigned by fax. I think it's the only case in the world <laughs> where a president resigned by fax. So then all the situations just precipitated. Uh, <clears throat> our system allowed that when the president was out, then the president of Congress had to take the post. And uh, that's how come uh, President Valentin Paniagua, who was an outstanding, outstanding Democrat from the opposition, he became the transitional president of Peru. Uh, he ratified us on the investigative team, and he put all the political will uh, in order to know what has happened with this uh, criminal network. When we started the investigations, our hypothesis was that we were confronting a typical uh, scheme of corruption in Latin America. That means uh, very extensive administrative corruption with some high-level officials involved. But after the two, first two weeks of investigation, what we found is that a, a totally different scenario, because we were talking for the first time in the case of Peru of organized crime. Uh, this was in uh, early uh, 2001. And uh, this is the organigram you have in, in that page. Uh, what we found is a pyramidal organization. And on the top of the pyramid, there were three heads of this criminal network. That was AFF is Alberto Fujimori, the president of Peru. VMT is Vladimiro Montesinos, the intelligence service uh, chief and the right hand of the president. And NHR is Nicolás Hermosa, who was the general commander of the armed forces. So three of these people 
uh, these three people, I mean, were the heads of this organization, and from there down, you had all the powers of the state, all the institutions under control. So the guy on the left is uh, Alipio Montes de Oca. He was the president of the electoral court. The guy next to him is Alejandro Rodriguez. He was the chief justice, the president of the Supreme Court. The guy in the middle, Victor Hoy Y, he was the president of Congress. The bold guy next to him was in charge of laundering the money that the organization was taking from different institutions. And the last picture is of a general of the armed forces, because the armed forces were in charge of the territory that was dealing with drug trafficking. Peru is, with Colombia, the first producer of cocaine in the world. So there's a lot of money in some uh, spaces of our territory that are under control of the armed forces. So the armed forces organized by Montesinos were all the time charging money to the drug traffickers, and this money went to this criminal network. Uh, the relevant thing of the judiciary in this case and Congress to, to respond to your question is that the president of the Supreme Court guaranteed the, the network of Fujimori and Montesinos totally impunity. So the attorney general and the chief justice were under control that not even one claim against one person of this criminal network would go, would go through. And uh, when some judge or prosecutor was trying to get out of, of their control, he was immediately uh, sacked or moved to another place. So this worked very efficiently because for 10 years, there was not even one case against one of the members of uh, this organization. And on the political side, it was also uh, effective because Congress, through all this bribing to different opponent leaders, or members of, of other caucuses had a total control of Congress. So uh, the government was ruling really with, uh, easy, with an easy path, no opposition in the political side. Uh, these investigations, just to have an idea, uh, in the first 14 months were open against 1,500 people, all the high level officials of the state. The only one that was out of the control of this organization was the ombudsman. And uh, uh, of them, we sent, uh, in the first 12 months, more than 140 people to prison. Among them, the president of the Supreme Court, the Electoral Court, Congress, uh, the Attorney General, 14 general of the Army and the police went to prison too. So this was a huge uh, organization. The names you have here on, on the right are the operational teams that were working from the intelligence service. So they had everything very well planned. Uh, and I think that this is a quality difference with other authoritarian and corrupt uh, regimes that we have had in Latin America, because I think this is the first one that was really professional as a criminal network capturing the entire state of Peru. That's depressing. Um, <laughs> let me actually ask you, you, you mentioned something um, that's actually come up in, in several of the conversations. I'm interested in your perspective on it. So speaking crudely, uh, in terms of resisting these various kinds of leaders, and again, we understand there are a lot of differences, we've had some conversations about rules and laws and checks and votes and elections and so forth. We've also had a fair amount of discussion of people in the streets. Right? That didn't come up as much maybe in our first panel on Berlusconi, but when we had our conversation about uh, Thailand and the Philippines, and uh, certainly with respect to Peru, and I, I gather there's to some extent in South Africa as well, there's the people in the streets outside of the normal channels of even electoral mobilization. And um, I realize it's a very broad question, but I'd be interested in your perspectives, particularly in the context of the countries in which you have primary expertise, but also more broadly uh, about the efficacy of these different kinds of strategies of resistance. And one of the things that struck me in the earlier discussion we had about toxin in Thailand is there seemed to be some skepticism that the resistance to toxin that took the form of protest that shut down the capital city was ultimately all that productive and may have made things worse. In the story we heard about Joseph Estrada in the Philippines, it actually sounded like it was more of a happy story, that people power too and people taken to the streets at least that was my, the way I experienced the discussion in, in the last panel. So I'd be interested in, 
I think you understand what I'm getting at with the question. For those who are really concerned about these kinds of leaders, there's trying to act against them through the normal legal or electoral channels, and there's trying to mobilize popular protests in a different way. They can be complementary, but they're, they're different. So I'd be interested, maybe Paul can ask you that question first, then throw the same thing over to you, Jose. Sure. I mean, I think that the, the strategy in South Africa has been very effective, um, and it hasn't really drawn a distinction between... Uh, sort of street activism and, and legal activism. Essentially, they've been running in parallel and in support of each other, uh, and that's been a very effective strategy. So uh, the, both the opposition political parties that have emerged since 2012 in particular, there's the Democratic Alliance, the DA, and these the Economic Freedom Fighters, as they call themselves, EFF, and they've both very actively and aggressively pursued legal cases in order to prevent the worst of abuses, but also to try and hold the presidency to account. Now, in a, in a country like South Africa, what's so effective about that is that it creates these grand political moments uh, where, I mean, maybe it's different in other countries, but in South Africa, the national conversation is politics. You know, you sit down at any dinner table, you're speaking about politics rather than sports. Uh, so when you have a high-level uh, judicial finding around a very sensitive political matter, it becomes this huge national political set piece, which is covered in the media, which is on TV being streamed live, and everybody's watching it effectively. And everybody is interested. It's amazing to me the extent to which South Africans over the last 20 years have, as ordinary people, become incredibly conversant with the law. I mean, after the Oscar Pistorius trial, which is like trial of the century, there are people, you know, you speak to anybody, you can know, have somebody serving you food in a restaurant, and you'd be speaking about the difference between, you know, manslaughter and, and, and a meditated, premeditated crime, and people be throwing around Latin terms. But it'll be, uh, it, it's proven these, these great political moments has then allowed for other mobilizations, so street, street marches and, and anti-corruption marches, and they've dovetailed quite closely. Um, and that's all relied, in turn, on a very vibrant media space. And South Africa is very lucky um, to have a, uh, a very vibrant independent media. It has a very vibrant um, sort of a non-profit investigative journalism scene, in particular a unit called Amabungani, who've just been uncovering you know, the worst of the abuses over the last five or six years. My sense, though, is that in the end, and I think this is where we're really getting at, is whether there are legal mechanisms to to constrain or particularly to end a Trump presidency. I think that's underlying a lot of this thinking. And my take would be that in the South African example, those things have been very effective, that the lawfare has been effective at creating these grand political moments. But in the end, the only change that's going to really matter is when the ANC loses the election, the next election, or believes it's going to lose the next election. Because right now, if it believes that with Jacob Zuma as president, it could still survive with the majority until the next election and then try and recover from his presidency, nothing's going to happen. <coughs> but if it becomes clear that, that through that mobilization that you're changing hearts and minds, essentially, and that people are going to start voting differently, then political change happens. And I feel like that's the same thing here. I don't, I don't have a huge amount of faith in the ability of the, the modern investigation in particular to lead to... Uh, something that would seriously threaten a Trump presidency. I think it would make it, a Trump presidency very complicated, and, and it would change the narrative quite substantially. But in the end, this is a political fight, and it has to be fought as a result on a whole series of different fronts. If you want, if you, assuming you want to contest the Trump presidency, you have to use all of these measures of your disposal. You've got to make sure that you support independent media. You've got to make very creative use of the law, um, hopefully with pro bono support, because that's what a lot of South African stuff has done, done with. And you need to be very effect effectively mobilizing in your local communities. And those, all those things together can work together. But I don't think a, a single strategy of lawfare in particular is, is really the way forward to, to constrain. It might, might constrain the worst of Donald Trump's policies, but it's not going to constrain him necessarily. All the cases we are talking about today is what uh, we in Transparency International now call grand corruption. Uh, four years ago, uh, on our 20th anniversary, we got together in Berlin and we started reflecting if we had been successful in our work fighting corruption. And, uh, of course, we have achieved many uh, goals 
Uh, we have put the issue of corruption in the top of the agenda. Transparency International has contributed to the creation of uh, international instruments like the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, the regional conventions. We work with uh, uh, multinational and uh, different institutions around the world uh, addressing issues of corruption. And our chapters in each country are dealing with very difficult agendas on the field. But at the same time, we feel that there's still too much corruption out there. So the question at that time was, is this type of corruption we're confronting nowadays is the same type of corruption we had to confront 20 20, now 25 years ago, when TI was founded. And the response was that this is a different phenomenon. This is a totally different animal, and we are now naming it grand corruption after several exercises with academics, activists, and, and uh, people uh, working in different fields like human rights. We uh, went uh, uh, to make, uh, to work on a definition of grand corruption. And now, uh, we have this definition. For us, grand corruption has basically three elements. It's committed by people with a significant amount of power, political or economical power, so it can come from the private or the public sector. The second element is that it mobilizes immense amounts of resources, as we have heard in these cases. And the third one, probably that makes the big difference with the regular corruption of the past is that this type of corruption is having a significant impact on the lives of people. Grand corruption affects human rights, uh, kills people, denies health, denies education, access to clean water, etc. Usually grand corruption uh, uh, mobilizes itself through organized crime and usually it remains impune. So impunity is one of the characteristics of this type of crime. So uh, when we talk about grand corruption and plutocracy, then we find <clears throat> uh, that there are basically right now in the world two models of fighting corruption. And amazingly, both of them basically come from Latin America. So we do not only export football players and corrupt leaders, but we also export anti-corruption models. The first one is what I call the Peruvian-Brazilian model. Uh, and uh, this works when the moral reserve of the system of justice, prosecutors, agencies, uh, some in the case of Brazil, including some police and judges, uh, decide to confront corruption and they do it successfully. In the Peruvian case, we have a bunch of young prosecutors and young judges putting all these people in prison and bringing down the criminal network to the point that Fujimori and all the leaders of this organization are now convicted. Fujimori has been convicted to 25 years, like Montesinos, Hermosa, and all the others. And in the case of Brazil, there's this uh, task force team led by former Attorney General Janot uh, dealing with immense powers in Brazil uh, from the private sector, huge construction companies, and the entire political system in Congress and in power. The result of that, Dilma Rousseff stepped down, Lula now is convicted, and probably he will have to go to jail if the Superior Court confirms that conviction. Uh, Temer is there because the Congress just uh, gave him impunity with terrible decisions, because many of the people in Congress are also tainted of corruption. But then you have these courageous prosecutors and judges dealing with these cases and uh, generating amazing results never expected in a situation like that. Uh, so that's one, one model. With their own reserves, the systems uh, react and can bring some results uh, to the table. The other model is the Guatemalan one. And that's an extreme model of fighting corruption because it happens when the systems, the local systems of justice have collapsed. And that's the case of Guatemala. More than 90% of impunity, meaning that from each 10 cases of high impact, crimes of high, high impact, nine never arrived to a conclusion. Uh, and this was so gross that when some congressmen were killed in Guatemala, then the international community said, this is too much. United Nations and some relevant countries pushed the government of Guatemala, and they had to accept 
uh, the implementation of an international commission that is called the CICIC, the Commission Against Impunity of Guatemala. It's a unique model because it implies some uh, uh, reduction of sovereignty of the Guatemalan state because this is a kind of international attorney general that comes with his team of 50 investigators from different parts of the world and they work hand to hand with the local prosecutors. So now the head of the CICIC is a Colombian, former uh, prosecutor in Colombia, and he has a big team of international investigators. And after nine years of work, the results have been also amazing. The former president of Guatemala is in prison, the vice president too. Uh, many ministers and high level officials that were impugned for decades now are being investigated to the point that the prisons are so full that they have to open camps. And now you have hundreds of public officials in these camps waiting for trial. Uh, it's so effective that the current president of Guatemala, who feels that he's also under threat because of the illegal financing of his campaign, tried to throw away Mr. Velasquez, and he has failed. Why? Because this is the element uh, that you brought to, to, to the discussion with your question, because people is mobilizing and reacting against corruption. And I think this is the new element uh, that we have right now on, on the anti-corruption world. Uh, not only different models struggling successfully in some cases with corruption, so we have shadows and lights, shadows because we have a lot of cases of corruption and big ones, but at the same time we have uh, something that never happened before, that is people that are going into trial, into prison, and uh, convictions that have been uh, occurring in, in several countries. The new element is a people mobilization. Millions of people in Brazil went to the streets and uh, generated the first results on the Lava Jato case or the car wash case. Uh, when the prosecutors in Brazil were blocked by Congress with the 10 measures where they were proposing in order to facilitate their investigations, uh, and the Congress was not attending the request of the prosecutors, they went to the streets. It's a unique case in the world where prosecutors go to the street to collect signatures from citizens. And uh, they uh, collected more than 2.5 million signatures on behalf of, the, of their effort. They're still struggling with that. That is not solved. But people mobilization in this case was, was uh, very interesting. And it has replied uh, and replicated, I mean, in the case of Guatemala, for more than four months, thousands of people every Saturday on the streets uh, protesting against corruption until they obtain the result. Three days ago, when the president uh, tried, and the Congress tried to pass some ridiculous law in order to bring impunity to some high-level corrupt officials in Guatemala, the people went to the street again, and Congress had to withdraw the project. The same happened in Honduras. In Dominican Republic, more than 100,000 people in the Green March Against Corruption one Sunday of, of January. In South Korea, more than one million people brought the president down when corruption allegations went through. In Romania, more than 1.5 million people on the streets uh, uh, obtained as a result that the Congress stopped this uh, draft law in order to legalize uh, bribe under 10,000 euros. And uh, we've seen this in South Africa, in Russia. Uh, people is mobilizing. What, the challenge for us in the civil society side is that we don't want more Arab Springs. I mean, this huge reaction in different places, but some months after, nothing happens. Mubarak is free again. Ben Ali will probably return to Tunisia. And the results that were expected of these reactions uh, have not been sustainable. So the challenge for uh, civil society organizations dealing with corruption is how can we engage with these movements of the people and bring sustainability to these efforts. So it's certainly fascinating that sometimes people seem to mobilize against corruption in huge numbers and in other circumstances we kind of scratch our heads and say, as many of the, the first panels in, in, in the discussion today emphasize, people say, well, he's corrupt, but everyone's kind of corrupt. It's, it's really interesting 
um, and sort of unpredictable when you get these sort of earthquakes of, of people getting mobilized. But I, I'm glad to hear you say uh, that Latin America is exporting anti-corruption strategies because as a citizens of the United States, I would happily import um, anything that, you, that you're uh, uh, providing. Um, and maybe that actually is a way to set up the... I want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions. I'm sure there will be plenty for the audience. But I did want to ask one more question to the two of you uh, to bring this back to what's going on in the United States right now. And Paul, you mentioned specifically the Mueller investigation. I'm glad you did, because I, I did want to bring that up in particular. So, um, and I, there are two aspects to this question. One is, as you followed, to the extent that you have, what's been happening in the United States over the last several months with respect to allegations of collusion with Russia in particular, the the firing of James Comey, the, the former head of the Federal Bureau of Investigations, uh, the appointment of Robert Mueller as special counsel to investigate these allegations, uh, the recusal of Jeff Sessions, the attorney general, the, the really, to many, shocking direct comments that the president of the United States made about that decision to recuse, and everything we've been learning over the past several weeks and months about the Mueller investigation, I'd be interested in first your perspective and how much what you know about both your home countries and this issue more generally uh, tells you about what you've been observing in the United States. Does this seem familiar? Does it seem different? Um, and then very closely related to that, if uh, Robert Mueller or members of his team were in this room or if they decide to watch the video later uh, <laughs> in their what I hope is no spare time whatsoever, um, you know, what, what would you say to them? I mean, Jose, you have a very direct experience doing this yourself. I mean, you were essentially in that role, although after Fujimori had left office for the most part, and Paul, obviously, you've, you've studied this issues, these issues very closely with respect to offices like the Office of the Public Protector in South Africa. So um, what do you learn from, what, from your respective home countries about what's been going on in the United States, particularly with respect to what we can hope for and what, we, what advice we might give to the people engaged in these investigations of possible wrongdoing in the Trump administration? Go first, or should I? You. Sure. Uh, my sense is that it's too soon to expend, expect results on, on the Trump investigations. Uh, he's a type of personality, I believe, that likes to collect enemies. And in these cases, what usually happens is when insiders start talking and providing evidence. Uh, and uh, my feeling is that Mueller doesn't have enough right now. Now he's talking about obstruction of justice, but not uh, the direct offense that was uh, originally under investigation. But uh, I am sure that uh, uh, when, when time start going on uh, and passing on, issues will start arising. Uh, I don't think it, it is sustainable for much longer, this aggressive uh, language and the way he is managing his conflict of interest. And I think that probably would be one of the vulnerabilities of uh, President Trump in the near future. But I think it, it will take some time until people start talking. Uh, I think it's too soon to, to think that there will be a solid case in order to generate him a, a serious uh, legal uh, threat. Let me just ask you one quick follow-up before I turn it over to Paul. One of the interesting aspects of, of these kinds of investigations is how the prosecutor or investigating entity maintains not just its actual independence and impartiality, uh, but the perception of the general public. Because we've heard several people say before, the targets of these investigations always claim that they're politically motivated witch hunts. As Paul correctly observed before, sometimes they are in some countries. Sometimes anti-corruption prosecutions really are as in your phrase, weaponized against political opponents. And of course, we see Donald Trump already making this claim, sometimes implicitly, but sometimes fairly explicitly, about the Mueller investigation. We see this all over. So I'd be interested, again, before I turn over the more general question to Paul, from based on your experience doing this, uh, what can people in this role do to maintain public confidence that it's not politicized? Because again, of course, I, my, my understanding is the bulk of your investigation in Fujimori, Toledo was the president at that point, who was a political rival, so it would have been a little bit different from investigating the sitting president, but the Fujimori supporters must still have been, I assume, trying to make the argument that it was a politically motivated vendetta against their guy, no? Well, uh, it was not that clear, because remember, I was appointed by Fujimori, so sure. he couldn't say that <laughs> I was uh, appointed by the opposition. Uh, 
what we did, and it worked to us, but I think it's different, uh, totally different environments and societies, what we did was work uh, as much as possible in an open mode regarding the public opinion. So I uh, formally had one press conference per month where I presented the advances of the investigation. Of course, what could be disclosed for strategy, we had to reserve uh, many information, but uh, people was following the investigation and they knew that all the decisions were uh, also attending the respect of due process of law. Uh, but as, as you said, there is no corrupt that doesn't say that he is a political uh, uh, persecution victim. And uh, I think very few people now believe that that really happens. Uh, so if you have hard evidence and uh, people is informed of how you are conducting your investigations, I think you, you can uh, continue without the danger that people really believe that you are politically motivated in, in a case like this one. Paul, over to you, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. Sure. I mean, the, the thing that I'm, I'm struck by listening to a lot of people speak today, and I think I've, I said it to you previously in private conversation, is about the sort of how long a claim of conspiracy remains useful and how long that continues to retain, to retain traction for a president. So the reason I bring that up is because uh, in the first phase of, of Jacob Zuma's presidency, he very effectively argued, and he, and he mobilized politically within the ANC to argue that he was being targeted, that he was the victim of a political conspiracy. And unfortunately in that, he was helped by a, a very misguided high court judgment, which agreed with him, was overturned by subsequent courts. But that gave him enough legitimacy at that moment to claim that, that he was being targeted. He's never really changed that narrative. You know, whenever something has happened to him in his presidency that's reacted badly on him, he's, he's repeated the conspiracy narrative. And he's changed it. He's been quite sophisticated. So in the most recent incarnation, uh, as all the stuff about the Guptas started coming out in state capture, uh, it's actually quite disturbing what he did, sort of uh, Russian interference style. Uh, the Gupta family hired a, a UK public relations firm called Bell Pottinger, which a number of people might know because they've represented a whole range of some of the nastiest people in the world, some of the worst dictators. Uh, I think he, they represented Marcos for a while. Um, and uh, they created, they tried to create a false narrative by using Twitter bots and by bribing, well, trying to sort of speak to journalists and, and get them on side and, and create this idea that there was a secret conspiracy of white monopoly capital. That's how it's been phrased. It's old white South Africans who own lots of, you know, who have, you know, own the mines, who are working in conjunction with international capital to force Jacob Zuma out. And they're, they're inventing these, these, these allegations. What's remarkable about it is that for a very brief period of time, it got a little flurry of action and there was a little bit of interest in it, but it died. It's not effective. It's not effective as a counterclaim anymore. Nobody believes it. Nobody believes that there's a white monopoly capital conspiracy against Jacob Zuma. Basically, most people, most reasonable people, will now look at the facts and say, there's a real corruption problem here. There's a real problem with your conduct. And what strikes me about that and what strikes me about what other people have said is that's about the life cycle of a presidency, about where in time these allegations happen. I mean, you said earlier that there, there was a natural process at the end of Fujimori's presidency where he's been in power for quite a long period of time already. He's already lost a degree of legitimacy. There's already a bit of, you know, things haven't changed. He's made enemies. There's the base has fallen apart. And at that moment, then corruption charges, then, then, then legal activity starts to have a bit of impetus. I, I think that it's too early in Donald Trump's presidency for that to be the case. I don't think he's been in power enough to alienate the, enough number of people in his own base, which is what really matters. Uh, and he will eventually, because that's what happens with time. Every president does it, because you can't please everybody in, in the end. Um, and that will then become, it'll become more effective. I also think that claiming conspiracy, claiming fake news, fake news is going to be a phrase I, I genuinely believe that in eight years' time we laugh at. Because right now it's very politically current, I mean, it feels very important, feels very scary, but honestly I feel that over time there is a, there's something about the accumulation and the weight of fact and the weight of historical fact, which in the end overdoes or sort of overpowers the, the current journalistic moment. Um, and I think that's what's probably going to happen with Donald Trump. I also think there's something to be said about the nature of 
what's being investigated. Uh, I don't necessarily think, it, I, don't, I haven't seen information, obviously I'm not part of the investigation, and I'm watching this very much from the outside. It doesn't seem to me that there's that much credible, really compelling evidence that links Donald Trump himself personally. That's what really matters. Not, not, not His family matters, but really he's the personal brand here. And it doesn't seem to me that there's enough linking him to uh, the, the, the Russia allegations. When it comes to the, I think he's in far more trouble when it comes to the firing of James Comey, you know, and as somebody who, you know, does anti-corruption work, I'm horrified by it. I think this is a disaster. I think this is, how could you possibly do this? I'm, I think it's outrageous. But I think if you were to ask a member of his base, they wouldn't think it's that big of a, a big deal. They'd be like, no, he's a deal maker. This is what he does. That's why we elected him. To me, it doesn't seem like these, these, these allegations are sufficient enough to really scandalize his own party and his own base sufficient to create the political movement to replace him. And that's what I think in the end is how it's going to play out. If, if there's going to be an impeachment process, and this is, you know, I think it is something we need to consider with Donald Trump, it's only going to happen at that point at which the Republican Party realizes or feels or has calculated that he is a negative for them and they're going to lose votes uh, elsewhere. It's only when he starts to harm their own particular brand that they'll take, take action. That's not there yet, I don't think. I think he's too useful in this moment. And I don't see that the, the Mueller investigations are substantive enough to change those, those opinions. So let me open it to questions from the audience. Please raise your hand, and we've got uh, people with microphones. I think there's a question over there. Oh, and uh, right there first. Okay. We've got a few. Okay. Um, my question is about balancing uh, practicality in terms of, like, on one hand, you want to spread the accountability process wider, not just limit to Zuma or whoever, one person. But then if you spread it too wide, it becomes more and more complicated. If you don't spread it wide enough, you get allegations that this is all politically motivated and selective. If you spread it too wide, all the elites will fear that their turn will come to and they could get united. And in a country, in a society where too many people are tainted, it could also create instability because eventually you have to stop somewhere. Otherwise, everybody will be you know, getting hauled up. Even in the Nazi uh, Nuremberg trials, they decided that the process had to be somewhat selective because so many people were involved with the Nazis. So what's the balance between like, you know, practicality on one hand, you want the process to be wide enough that it's impactful, but you don't want to spread it so wide that it becomes Im Im impossible to continue the momentum and, and then it becomes so destabilizing that eventually it loses steam and then eventually you, it becomes counterproductive. So what's the, what's the right balance? Um. I would say there are two types of considerations. The first one is that on technical basis, you cannot conduct a criminal investigation with political uh, criteria. So uh, your first argument is correct. If you have a massive case of corruption, like the Fujimori one or most of the cases we've been discussing today, where hundreds of thousands and may maybe thousands of people are involved, let's think of the Lava Jato case, uh, this case that's coming from Brazil and has impacted in 14 countries of Latin America. We're talking about thousands of people involved. There, in that case, the decision has to be uh, taken in order of the strategy of the investigation. You cannot handle at the same time thousands of people in one investigation. But it, it couldn't be manageable. So you have to prioritize. And uh, we had that challenge at the beginning in Peru. We started pursuing everybody with the same intensity intensity, uh, the football player that received uh, $10,000 from Montesinos to make propaganda uh, to the regime, money that was coming from illegal origin, so it was money laundering. Then uh, this minister that had stolen $50 million from, from the state. So we started to prioritize, and that's under the discretion in most of the cases of the prosecutors and investigators, what do you pursue uh, first, and what can you uh, postpone, or even in some cases, just not take. 
Uh, the other question has to do with some of the big cases of, of grand corruption we are observing nowadays. And uh, like in Brazil, for example, many people are saying, up to where is, are these investigations going to be taken? This is going to destroy uh, the Brazilian uh, state. This is going to make unfeasible the country. And I think that's a consideration that cannot be taken by a prosecutor or by a judge. They have to accomplish with the law. And at the end, the responsibility of these consequences are not the responsibility of the judicial operators or the prosecutors. It's a responsibility of the corrupt. And uh, what I've seen from my experience is that at the end, even though you can conduct high level and high impact investigations with uh, some uh, thousands of people involved, uh, states never collapse. I mean, in these cases, it is better to prosecute and uh, obtain the results you are pursuing, and the state will see how can it generate new uh, ways of organizing itself to uh, 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 maintain uh, a, a stable and, and a new uh, organization. When you see which are the failed states of the world, in that list, there are not even one case uh, of failed state as a consequence of an effective and, and productive investigation against corruption. On the contrary, all those failed states are there because corruption got out of control. And then it generated violence and lack of governance and stability, and uh, that's a real collapse. Do you want to add to that, or should we take our next question? Oh, such a good answer, I think we'll just leave it. All right, uh, I think we've got a, couple, a hand over there and then a hand over there. Thank you. Uh, when it comes to um, well-resourced uh, investigations of corruption, particularly when it, in, when it comes to anti-corruption commissions, there seem to be two schools of thought on what strategy to pursue. So you get those like Robert Klitgaard who say, fry the big fish early. Uh, then there are others who say, no, you know, build up the case, uh, start with uh, lower level or mid-level officials. Um, when, when would, based on the experience of both of you, what, when do you think it's appropriate to, let's say, go after the big fish early, and when might it be more appropriate to have a, uh, a bottom-up approach? I mean, it's a difficult question to answer from South Africa because, sadly, there's been neither, right? Uh, there's been no big fishes that have been properly prosecuted, and there have been no little fish that have been successfully prosecuted. I mean, I think, you know, that's a finer point of of how to build a prosecution that I'm not a prosecutor, I'm an investigator. So I can't necessarily give you a good sense of how that works in terms of strategy. What does work, I think, it, I could answer from a point of, of, as an activist and a campaigner and as a political mobilizer, is that, uh, I'll give you a good example. In South Africa, there's, a, there's an organization called Corruption Watch, not affiliated with us, but actually run by, by very good people. Uh, and they uh, do some work on much lower level bribery, so the you know the, the bribes that you pay to 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 metropolitan to, to your you know traffic police, and they have like a bribery reporting system, and that's a terrific project, uh, and I support everything they do in it. But I don't think it's gotten anywhere near as enough public support as it should. What has been really effective for them has been pursuing legal cases against some of the the most prominent political players in the country. Uh, because it does generate headlines, generates news, and it generates political support. And this is the reality. In, in the 10 years that I've been working in this field, anti-corruption, and I've been investigating cases uh, around the world and dealing with a huge number of prosecutors, the thing that happens over and over and over again is good prosecutors who are hamstrung by politics or good prosecutors who are uh, replaced or pushed out or essentially have the rug pulled out from underneath them. And on so many occasions where I've gone to prosecutors, they've said to me that the best thing you can do, the best thing that your organization can do and, and through your advocacy and campaigning work you can do is publicize this because I need the political support to pursue this, this particular investigation. And the best way for that to happen is if they go after the big fish. So from a, an advocacy campaigning thing, I would say you have to go after the people who... Uh, I think probably have the most public uh, 
cachet. I think it's also very useful to choose those people where if you get them prosecuted, you make the most amount of institutional change, right? So you don't, so not just that somebody's famous, it's not that somebody's egregious, it's that if you get somebody good in that position, if you remove somebody corrupt from that position and put somebody good in that position, they can make fundamental systemic change. Uh, and that's how I would, you know, from my side and how we sort of decide on, on what to, to investigate and, and what to help with. Uh, I say that both uh, ap approximations are legitimate. If you have the kitchen ready and the oil is hot and you have the fish hooked, a big one, you just throw it there. I mean, we did it. In Peru, our first detainee was a very high-level profile lawyer, uh, very nearly linked to Montesinos. He was untouchable. Everybody knew he was on the game, but nobody ever had touched him. When people saw that two days before Christmas, this guy was detained and thrown into prison, the day after we had dozens of people trying to arrive to plea agreements with us. So it, it really worked. It was a shock. So frying big fish in that case was really a good decision. But there are other cases where the kitchen is not ready or you don't have the big fish hooked. Brazil is a good example. After four years, they started looking for anchovies, no? these uh, money laundering uh, exchange uh, people, and they follow the trail until they arrive to a real, real shark, Marcelo Odebrecht, and after three years, then they went after him. If they had gone to Marcelo Odebrecht first, probably with the evidence, without the evidence and not all the elements they needed, Odebrecht wouldn't have started talking and putting 72 other officials of the company uh, uh, talking to the prosecutor. So it depends on the context as a strategy that you develop uh, in a specific investigation. But both of them work. I thought we had a hand over here. Yes? Yes, please. And then over to you, Beth. Thank you for a great discussion. My question is for Jose Ugas. Do you, you talk about the two political, uh, the two models, the Guatemalan and the Peru and the Brazilian model. Do you think that the Guatemalan model would work if it's implemented in Venezuela with everything that is going on right now? Not with Maduro. Maduro has to, to fell down, and I hope that will happen very soon. Uh, but what the CICIC has proven is that even without enough political will from the government that receives the model, it works if there's international support. And uh, Ivan Velasquez is doing what he's doing because uh, there's a, a network of countries uh, that are supporting and organizations that are supporting his work and the people of Guatemala. There have been several attempts in these nine years to close a commission, and none of them have succeeded. Recently, uh, President Morales, who was a clown in his previous life, and now he is remembering the work he has done, I think, he flew to the United Nations to talk to the Secretary General just to uh, close, uh, 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 take away Velasquez, and, and United Nations said no. And then the people went to the street, and the president, and the constitutional court decided against the president. So he stayed alone. Uh, there are many countries right now, people in countries, that are looking to this model. In Ukraine, there is a big demand for having a CISIC because it is clear that the judiciary is not working. After four years, of uh, Yanukovych running away with $7.5 billion. There's not even one case against him before the judiciary. Mexico, they don't want to accept it, but uh, in Mexico, the justice system has totally failed and probably would be an interesting candidate for an, uh, an international commission against impunity. So I think it's a very interesting model. It's politically costly because when you get into cases of grand corruption, then a lot of political considerations uh, start uh, moving around. That's the reason why United Nations is quite cautious of spreading the moral uh, to other countries. But the OAS already replicated the moral of Guatemala in Honduras. Now they have a maxi that is also an anti-punity commission with a little less powers than the CICIC, but it also started to work uh, efficiently. Great. I think, uh, can we get, uh, yeah, and then over to you. Hi. Um, I've been a journalist for 35 years, and I love to share your optimism, the, the chair of Transparent International. I have to say, in my lifetime as a journalist, and I've been covering many countries around the world, including my own Italy, I, I, I have the feeling that the appetite of the voters, of the 
where they can vote, let's say, of the, of the public for justice is lower and not higher, which worries me a lot. Uh, and I have two explanations I want to offer them to you. What happened in Italy, you know very well, we had that moment, that enthusiastic moment, we're going to get rid of you, uh, you know, stealing public money, wasting money, and there was a clean hand investigation. Do you remember? Tangent Topper in the early 19... Then a few things happened. You had prosecutors going into politics, a disaster, because they, it shows that they were not, they, they had sort of political motivation, or at least it allows politicians to say, okay, can you see? They had political motivation. Number two, people were not brought, they were <coughs> brought to trial, but nothing happened. Endless trials, and Italy is not alone. Do you know how many? People are in jail in Italy, since we started with Italy today, uh, for uh, financial crime and corruption. Do you know how many? 11. No, 287. In Germany, 6,000. So because we're not, the Germany is not 20 times more corrupt than Italy, <laughs> I tell you. There is something wrong there. It is true they have 20, more, 20 million more people. But there is a problem. We had banks. Luigi knows this very well. People that stole in banks, big public comp, they're all around it. They, all are, they, they, they got away with it, basically. They pass on in, onto their children, and they go. They don't, you know, I stopped going to conferences talking about honesty, anti-corruption, and ethical within companies, because half of the people that attended those companies with me in the 90s are either in jail, to very few, run away, or they just disappear with their ill-gotten money somewhere. And Italy is not the worst example at all. I'm talking about grown-up democracy, that we should have the appetite. Number two, because since we're talking about plutocracy here, I think the plutocrats have learned how to counterattack. They realize that they, they uh, Berlusconi is a master in that, as I said this morning, they, they in a way, they, they convince people that if you start attacking politicians and public figures for corruption, you start a process whereby the small fish or the person in the street may have a problem one day. So they try for this, you know, overall, uh, uh, let's, everybody is, is acquitted. And that's has been a very effective line, at least in Italy, and not only in Italy. So I, I want you, please, to tell me that I'm absolutely wrong. And uh, I should be, only young people, my young journalists have the appetite. I was talking to Columbia, and the professor at Columbia, and she was saying that her journal, young journalists and student journalists have that appetite. Uh, so maybe there is hope after all. But my experience is that this combined thing, the, the slowness and, and the failure of actually, in I'm talking about democracy, European democracy of bringing people to justice, convicted, put them in jail, and the, and the fact the plutocrats are smarter than ever, and they've learned how to counteract. Basically, they, they enroll the, the voters and the public on their side. Look, you know, it's not important. You know, be careful, because these judges start. In Italy, the campaign against the judges was relentless. And they were complete, they even invented, I, I close with a word, justicialista. Justicialista is impossible to translate. It's like a justice freak. An insult is, you know, I, I, on television, sometimes I would say, you know, these people stole a lot of money. They should be in jail. I'm not a bad person. I'm not cruel. But why a tiny drug dealer selling marijuana is in jail and these people's putting, you know, ruining the life of tens of thousands of people because of crazy bank, movings, uh, bank moves selling, uh, 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 selling, how do you say, cattive obligazioni? Yeah, bad bonds, like, they're, they're still around, and they told me, and I remember, journalists, 
fellow journalist, politician standing up and you sei un giustizialista, you are a justice freak. <laughs> so you now end up being insulted for, okay, that's all. <laughs> Sorry, it was not a... a <laughs> I don't know why I felt that you were talking only to me. <laughs> uh, I, I understand, I understand, I understand your frustration and pessimism. I certainly don't share it, but I understand it. Uh, I wouldn't be working in TI if I wouldn't be optimistic. And I think we've seen in these uh, last decades some uh, changes that uh, give us reasons to be optimistic. In a country like mine, uh, never before uh, uh, a criminal network like the one conducted by Fujimori would have reached justice, and it happened. And it's happening, some, it's happening in some other countries. Mane Pulite, you know, has been uh, in, uh, now discussed every day in Brazil. I mean, all the Italians are going to Brazil to explain what happened and what didn't work. And I think Brazilians are now uh, know more than Manu Politi than most of the Italian people. Uh, but I think these are accumulative processes. I mean, we won't see real changes probably because one case happened and the other one. But on the field, we also are seeing in local communities and, and uh, specific uh, uh, places that things can change. Even population changing their approach to the way they relate to their authorities and they monitor and make social auditing of uh, some municipalities are, and, and local governments. So, yes, there are many reasons to be uh, pessimistic or, or just uh, not believing that this will generate some change and that the, the fight is lost. But I think that there are several elements nowadays, and uh, I was going to say that it was a problem of your age, but I think we have almost the same age. <laughs> <laughs> but it is true that young people have much more optimism than most of, of us, and uh, it is quite weird because they have more years to live and they, they've seen terrible things, even though they are quite young. But uh, I insist that things are happening now that we haven't seen never before, and I think uh, that this is uh, a hope that if these processes continue, it could be an accumulative result in some time from now. I think we had one more question over here, yes? Thank you very much for um, the interesting and impressive stories and information. Um, my, my question is related to the two models that, that uh, you said South America is ex exporting. Um, in, in the two models, both of them are more of state-led uh, models with um, uh, prosecute with uh, courageous prosecutors and politicians um, <coughs> trying to investigate cri uh, corruption crimes. But but in, in some in, and then and then look for support from the people. But in some countries, like in Thailand, we are um, not so fortunate in some ways. Like we may not have that, with respect to the, the former prime minister, not that many um, honest politicians or courageous um, uh, prosecutors. Um, is there a way for the people to lead the, these anti-corruption campaigns and, and projects themselves as a bottom-up uh, campaign or projects? Uh, can can the people do them do it themselves, and should they do it? Yes, certainly yes. Uh, there are hundreds of stories that I can tell you of uh, successes and achievements from our chapters in the field in different countries and in very harsh conditions. I mean, so difficult countries like uh, Cambodia, Russia, Venezuela currently. Uh, civil society just fighting and obtaining results and, and uh, generating counter opinion and, and uh, bringing evidence that surface uh, situations of corruption that cannot be hidden and then someone has to, to react. So yes, if you go to Transparency International webpage, you will find hundreds of stories about success, uh, maybe not big cases like the ones we've been talking around, but at the local level and in specific countries, there are many cases where uh, 
uh, due to the lack of political will or capacity or lack of leadership of the authorities that people are making the change and, and it is happening in many places. Paul, do you want to add something to this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it's sort of directed at you, Anna Pepe. I think South Africa is, is a case where you can, you can look at it and if you have a cynical mindset, you can be very depressed very pessimistic because it looks like nobody's been prosecuted, it looks like all the, there's been state capture, it looks like all these institutions don't function. But what has changed very dramatically is people's understanding of what corruption is, why it's bad, uh, and it's become probably the most important political topic in the country. So there is a thing called the Social Attitude Survey in South Africa that takes place every year. People are asked what are their, their biggest concerns. Between 1994 and 2007, people's biggest concerns were, were unemployment and crime. From 2008 onwards, the number one concern addressed for all South Africans has been corruption. It's become the dominant narrative of the country. And what that's meant is that even though those particular institutions are captured, it started a long-term process where politicians now realize that their political lives, if it's going to extend beyond the current moment, relies on them being not corrupt, relies on a good governance narrative. And I think that sets South Africa on a really good path for the next you know, 20 or 30 years, is that the next government that comes into, into power is going to be held to the same principles. And that's, that's not a function of necessarily a functioning criminal justice system, because it doesn't function in many regards. It's because of popular pressure. Uh, and I do think that that changes things. When, you know, we've, been, we've said a lot of dismissive things about politicians. One of the things that I would add is that politicians are very loath to do something that's going to lose them support. And if you, in a sense, if you weaponize corruption from the other side, it's very powerful. If you make a politician realize that if they're associated with a corruption scheme, that that is a threat to their political life, then you see some real change happening. Um, and that, for me, is an, is an attitudinal change first. And that's about convincing people that corruption matters, because in a lot of countries in Italy, some people don't think that it matters, that corruption causes harm. And that's something that a lot of people don't believe in. And actually, this is... So I think it's quite interesting looking at the UK, which is where I live now. I've been living there for the last 10 years. And I spent a long time investigating the, the biggest defense company there called BAE Systems. And they're involved in systemic corruption, allegedly, around the world. And they eventually settled with the US, US DOJ. I remember writing articles and, and giving press interviews. And in 2007, the response that I always got, almost always got, was, well, if we don't do it, the French will do it. If we don't do it, the Germans will do it. There was no conception of harm, and there was no conception of corruption as something to be dealt with. And 10 years later, as problematic as it was, you have a national anti-corruption conference in the UK where suddenly you have the government taking corruption seriously. There has been a move on the discourse, right? I don't think you could hear, in my work, I very rarely hear anybody defend corruption anymore. That's not a discursive place you can go to anymore. You can't say it keeps our jobs because that, we've won that argument, I think. Um, and that's through people power. What a wonderful, optimistic note in which to end this panel. I hope you all join me in giving this panel a, panel a round of applause. So we're now going to move into uh, our concluding session. Uh, one of the first things I want to do very quickly, it's not in your program, is just to, to set this up to emphasize that we very much hope that the kinds of discussions that we're having here about these themes and topics will carry forward. Um, for those of you who are part of the Harvard community or in the Boston area generally, we're hoping that other institutions uh, affiliated with the university and elsewhere will help us uh, or, or will develop these themes on their own and carry them forward. Uh, one of those initiatives that I wanted to make sure uh, got mentioned today is a very exciting initiative at the Carr Center for Human Rights at the Kennedy School, and I wanted to invite uh, Sherman Treichman to come up and just say a very brief word about some of the programs that we're going to see in the next week and, and couple of months on this front. Just behind the scenes. I can use the podium right up here. I'm stumbling around on a broken ankle. Um, this coming Wednesday at noon uh, at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy, where I'm a senior fellow, we're going to conduct uh, the first of a number of sessions looking at confronting corruption in defense of human rights. I'm rather sanguine, uh, despite all of the obstacles 
that I'm hearing about. In 1999, uh, I held a year-long forum with Obia Zekwazili and uh, Gustavo Goriti and Luis Moreno Ocampo. Uh, we uh, started off with our students uh, at an Outward Bound uh, forum where we had our students uh, conduct rafts out of uh, bamboo and ropes and what have you, and we divided them to three units, crime, corruption, and accountability. Well, obviously, crime and corruption made it back from the Atlantic, and accountability sank. <laughs> but uh, I remain uh, absolutely determined to follow up on this wonderful forum. Uh, Matthew, I think you've constructed something absolutely ex wonderful in terms of a detonator for this year. And we're hoping that people will join us on Wednesday for the first of these forums. It's with Craig Unger, who's a contributing editor of Vanity Fair and the New Republic, looking at uh, Trump and um, the early real estate dealings and the kinds of investigations that we think uh, with the Magnitsky Act and other uh, efforts will help um, to expose and uh, really make a formidable difference. So um, there's a lot of activity. Uh, we're working specifically to encourage students to think about research projects with us. We've reached out uh, to Columbia Journalism School to a master's program in data uh, analysis on real estate dealings in New York. Lots of things are happening with Global Witness, with Oxfam, et cetera. Please come join us. Those of you who are students, that's noon. Uh, my co-convener and myself would be happy to talk to you, Nikos Passas, a remarkable expert on corruption for many decades. And I want to thank everybody who's participated here because you've stimulated a lot of thinking. And uh, I'm just uh, in the Gromsky camp of pessimism, of experience, optimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. So we're going to continue. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, just so you all know, there's, there's a printout.